I really feel like God wants to bring a cleansing and a consecration to your sound, to your ears, to your eyes. You have to be watchful. Every sin is a weight, but not every weight is necessarily a sin. And you have to discern what is a weight in your life. If we want to be voices, if we don't want to be just sound, we have to sort ourselves out. God, what are blind spots in my life? Where am I deceived? When people are called to a consecration, often it's for a purpose. And if you are not faithful to the consecration the Lord has called you to, you will end up in a battle that you are not ready to fight. Greetings <laughs> from South Manchester. <laughs> I just want to say thank you for everyone. You have been incredible to worship with. And it is, it is an honor. I hope I don't cry. I just had a baby a few weeks ago, so if I cry, if I <laughs> His name is Uriah Samuel Aladaron. And, and actually, you know, really funny thing, we didn't know he was coming. He wasn't planned. My husband didn't believe me when I took a pregnancy test. I said, take it again. <laughs> but it was, a, it was a beautiful surprise. And actually, we planned a trip to the USA during the time when I was pregnant. I was so far along, I had to hide my bump. And um, so I, I didn't know if they'd let me in the country. But um, while I was there, my own mum, she's here. Hi, mum. So, um, so while we were there, my mom said, my mom said, oh, isn't it so prophetic? Uriah Samuel Aladdin, USA. Oh. <laughs> but actually, actually in that time, you know, the whole prayer store, something about prayer storm in the USA was really bringing us. I don't, I don't have any news for you, by the way. I just, I know that there's a seed there. So um, who, who's from the US? <laughs> I think you're the loudest group. I love it, I love it. But it is such an honor, it's such an honor to, to lead. It is such an honor as a worship leader to not have to be a cheerleader, constantly go, come on people, come on, worship God, and trying to convince people that God's worthy. It's, uh, it's kind of embarrassing. It's mortifying, isn't it? And it's kind of like, do you want me to entertain you or do you want to worship God, you know? And I just want to honor every single one of you for not being that person. When, when you go into an atmosphere, when I go into an atmosphere, I don't want to drain it and be like the person, like I was talking to Ali before, isn't she amazing, Ali? She's the other white girl. <laughs> she, I, was talking, I was talking to Ali before and, and I was saying, you know, people kind of just stand there bored as if we can't see you. Like we don't just see a crowd, we do see individuals too. <laughs> not, to, not to scare you. We're not, we're not there watching you and judging you. We're, we're just like, come on, come on, come on. Give God what he's worthy of. Come on, you know? And, I, and it is such a breakthrough atmosphere, not, not just because everyone here in prayer storm and everything, but also because of your hunger, that you are drawing heaven down with your worship, your prayer. Just, and, and you know the thing, God never snuffs a sacrifice. So many have paid so much to get here. And we, and you know, we priced it really low because we wanted you to be able to come, and, but also cover the cost and everything. But the fact that you have journeyed here, you have paid the price, and, and you know, you, you weren't expecting what you got, you were expecting something else, but the thing is you came for God and the sacrifice, he never snuffs the sacrifice. And that is what is bringing down the fire, the hunger, the sacrifice, everything it took you to be here. And um, I just wanna honor you all for that. I absolutely love you guys. And you know, I really felt like as we were worshiping, I was like, I don't want this to stop. I don't wanna preach. And not just because I'm a bit nervous, very nervous, but <laughs> because I just, oh, this atmosphere, this, every single, Every single prayer session, worship session, word session, word session feels like the last night of a conference. You know what I mean? It's like, whoo, Jesus. Oh, I'm like, I want more, but I don't know if I can handle it. <laughs> but I, I just felt as well, um, as I was praying, we were singing the song, All the Earth Will Shout His Praise. And there's so many nations represented in here. And I feel like, I feel like there's an anointing on prayer storm 
to gather not just one people group, but so many. If you look on our stage, we have someone of Chinese descent, we have someone African, we have someone American, we have someone, we have someone British, that's me. And, um, <laughs> and then we have, we have um, British born Jamaicans and, and also, we have all sorts on our platforms because we believe that there is a culture of the kingdom that comes from multi, you know? And I'm believing, you know, there might be, I feel like there's lots of you in here that you, you may even feel the frustration of, I don't feel like I'm pushing past my own culture and breaking into other cultures and attracting people of other cultures, of other nations, other races and everything. But I feel like there's something you're going to pick up in this place that you're going to be able to reach people that you've not been able to reach, who don't look like you, who don't sound like you, but are called to you that are called to be a blessing to you. They may be different to you, but there is something of their anointing that is different, that when the, when the anointings come together, there's an explosion. And you know, I also felt like to say to some of you, you know, okay, I'm gonna gush on my team right now. I'll just, I mean, I can gush on everyone. I'm gonna just be really specific and say the worship team because I, I could gush on everyone all day. But like, I believe, and this is, partly biased. I believe God sent me the best people in the world. And it's not and it and it's not just the gifting, it's the hearts and the anointing and I felt to say to some people don't be threatened by anointings that come alongside you because they are a gift to you. Even if, even if they do exactly the same thing, like I have I don't have BVs, I have leaders on this platform. I don't just have people in the background. I have leaders. Our drummer is a prophetic drummer. Our music director is a prophetic musician. Every single singer, Victoria, Ali, Lisa, love them all and they are prophetic leaders in songs. And I really feel like to say to some of you, you need to let, let down envy and let down offense and different things because I, I feel like the enemy wants to use it against you. Uh, and sometimes it, it uh, and I get that it can, be, it can be tempting to kind of like push people down, to kind of raise yourself up, but don't try and do that. Let God raise you up. If he's gonna raise you up, he'll raise you up, all right? And raise up other people, train up other people to be stronger and greater than even you can imagine. And honestly, the Lord will bless you and it will be an explosion and they, are, they will be the greatest gifts. I have got the best friends I could ever have in our community and I am just spoiled. I, I say to people everywhere I go, I'm just like, I'm so spoiled rotten and I'm so thankful. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> And you know, um, another word I've, I've been feeling, and it's not gonna be the whole time of, here's a prophetic word, here's a prophetic, but I'm just layering a few things that I felt like God was saying. You know, the, there's been a few years of God exposing things within the church. And well done for staying strong in faith and holding on to your faith and consecration and walk with God. You know, because you know what that says? You are not, you are not, in the church, you are not following God because you are impressed by a man or a woman. Though they fall, you will not be shaken. Your faith will not be shaken. You know, and don't let, don't let others, com the, the compromise and the sin and the downfall of others affect your walk or shape your consecration. Because you might have been like, oh, you know, sometimes I, I have had the moments where I'm like, this person has fell what chance do I have? And the Holy Spirit's like, you've got me. You've got me. I, I live within you. So I just want to give you hope on that and also encourage you, don't just follow man. Don't be a baby. <laughs> you know, you can't, like it's, like, it's like I'm a worship leader. I can't do your worship for you, right? Prayer leaders, they can't do your prayer for you. You have to, prayer storm is a movement of prayer, fasting and intercession. And we're calling people to a lifestyle, but 
it's a DIY thing and we've been saying it all this time. And that's why a lot of the time we don't do a lot of like hands-on ministry because we want to raise you as warriors that actually you are doing it yourself. You are, you hear from God yourself. Isn't it crazy? Like, like I remember actually, this is James's story, but I, you know what? I can tell you, you, sh- you steal all my stories, so it's fine. So, so James was um, in... Uh, he'd just moved to the UK and I don't know how many years he'd been here, maybe one or two or something. And um, he was in the centre of Manchester and the, uh, the, queen, the Queen of England, the one that just passed away. She's in heaven, we're believing. Amen. But um, not that my amen can change it. But, um, <laughs> but she was an evangelist, okay, so I'm believing it. But um, she, was walking, she was walking through um, Manchester and she just happens to stop and James is in the crowd, walks to James. The Queen of England. Like, okay, for you Americans, I go to, Amer- I go to America and people are like, have you met the Queen? And I'm like, no, have you met the President? <laughs> it's like, England is small, but it's, it's not that small. There's a lot of us in, condensed in a small space. So no, I've not even, I don't even know if I've been in the same city as the queen at the same time so no but the queen walked up to James and obviously there's probably loads and loads of people over she walks up to James and she kind of looks in into his face and and she's like oh hello (laughs) are you a student (laughs) and James is like yeah And he was like, and James ended up on the radio and people like, wow, you met the queen, what was it like? What was it like? And he went, and he went back home and, and uh, I paraphrase because I can't remember the word for word thing. But God said something on the, li- on the lines of, of this to him. You get excited to talk to the queen, but I'm the king of kings and I know your name. I know every hair on your head. I know the beginning from the end. And, and it's just like, What? <laughs> Do you know what? I lost my train of thought, which is really funny. Oh, well. If I was making a point, Lord, finish it for me. So, but anyway, we have access to the King of Kings. So we have no excuse. Oh, that's it. We're DIY. So, so we have no excuse. We do have access to the King of Kings. It's not like you pick a slot in the day or in the year that you get to talk to him on the phone and you have to, you know, listen to a bunch of songs on the, in the waiting line. It's like, Lord, and he speaks. And he's closer than your breath. Like, everyone just take a breath, go. He's closer than that. That went inside you and he's within you already. How crazy is that? How wild is that? The King of Kings. I'm losing my voice so I can't even let out certain tones. I'm like, but but God, but that is that is the closest proximity you can like your closeness to God is even closer than you can possibly get to a spouse, right? And that is incredible. So let the King of Kings. Let that relationship be more important to you than some man somewhere with a great anointing laying hands on you. Praise God for the laying of hands. It's biblical, it's good. But actually, what is more amazing is Holy Spirit is in you. Christ in you, right? Christ in you, a hope of glory. But I'm really believing, you know, as we're, as we're journeying this life, that you and I will enter into deeper and deeper consecration. And it's not like we're on this earth saying, how much can I get away with and still make it into heaven? But how far and abandoned and consecrated can I become to bring heaven on earth? To be how close can I walk with God without being sucked up to heaven on a chariot? I don't think chariots get sucked up, but you know what I mean. So, so you know, I when them. Um, I, um, I was really contemplating on something and something that I'm guilty of as well. That um, Has anyone ever heard of main character syndrome? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think we have suffered that so much as a whole, both as a church and in the world. And it's got to a point where it's like, where it's like we're so think of ourselves where we're just like me, 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 and we don't really grow up. 
And we don't really mature past our own wants and our own needs and things. And it's bred this hate of children. Like, there, there are so many spaces. And I was mortified. I didn't even want to fly to America um, in a way because I was seeing so many things online about people um, complaining about pregnant women and complaining about kids on flights. And I was like, wow, this, this society has become a child-hating society because we're becoming main character driven, all about our own comfort. And, it, and what that means is people are having less children, which means we are not maturing into mothers and fathers. And the thing about that is God isn't a God of the me, me, me. He's a God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. It's about the generations. So when we're thinking about even the building altars, you have to think beyond yourself. For some of you, you are just setting up and you are starting out for the generations ahead of you. And you've got a lot of hard work to do. Some of you have already had a lot of that work done for you. But I, don't, but I want to encourage you, don't even just rest in that. Actually, go harder in that for the generations, that actually how far can I go in my family to see God's glory on this family line? Mature to men and women of God, mothers and fathers. And you don't need to be a biological mother, a biological father. I have, I have mothers in this room. In fact, I think I have about four mothers in this room. I have, I have the pastor that I grew up with, Pastor Janet. She, can you give everyone a wave? Stand up, give everyone a wave. So, so um, the amazing thing of Janet, I might get in trouble after saying this, but she felt like God say, lay everything down, don't have kids for the sake of the ministry. And that's what some people are called to. And she and, she and her husband um, adopted me. Not adopted, but I actually have a biological mother that didn't get rid of me. But she, um, <laughs> I'm thankful because I'm hard work sometimes. Sometimes I'm a delight, right, mom? <laughs> I'll pay you later. But, um, but, ja but people like Janet, who raised me in faith, uh, um, taught me about women in leadership. So I grew up not knowing that people had something against women in leadership, women speaking, women leading worship. I, was, I grew up oblivious to that, so I was shocked when, when people started complaining. I have Mama C. So can you stand up and just wave everyone a wave? So Mama C, she's called Colette Dallas, but can everyone say, hey, Mama C? So I call her Mama C. She is a mother in this movement and has been a blessing to so many. And um, she is part of the leadership at Prayer Storm. There are four of us and Mama C is one of them. She's called Colette Dallas if you want to be more respectful. But if you're a bit of a Becky Aladdin, you're allowed to say, hey, Mama C. And then, wait, there's one, two. Ah, I have my own biological mom. Stand up, mom, stand up. She's like a foot shorter than me. <laughs> so so that's, that, that's my own mom who, who, um, who got saved when she, was really, when she was really young. She was like a punk rocker. So everyone was like scared of my parents because they looked like Morticia Adams and Billy Idol. It was scary. And then, and then I have my um, mother in love. I call her my angel in law because she is the sweetest woman you'll ever meet. And everyone, you hear these stories of mother in law horror stories. I have not one bad story. Like, she's always so sweet. I've never heard her say a bad thing about anyone. Where is she? Where is she? Where? She's over here. Could you stand up for us? This is James's mom. And, they, and they, came, they came over here as uh, missionaries many years ago. Um, came here as missionaries many years ago. They gave up a very, very good job, like in a massive, massive church as assistant pastors to come and, and serve in Manchester, which, wow, like, thank you, God. I thank you, God, for all, all these mothers. I have more mothers in the room, and I just want to bless you all. But it is so important to be a generation to who prays beyond yourself, who prays beyond your own breakthrough, who prays beyond your own needs, who prays beyond your own comfort, but for generations and nations, if you're kind of like, God, I want you to use me, it's get, like, it may start out as the main character syndrome, and Lord, for, forgive us for that, but you end up becoming a servant of all. You end up becoming a mother. You end up becoming a father. So we need to mature, you know? 
So I, actually, this is a really funny story. I was like, I wasn't going to say it because I didn't know if James had already said it. But no, actually, I'll tell you later. I'll tell you later. So, so anyway, I had a dream. Um, I don't, I can't even remember. You know, pregnancy gives you brain frog, fog. And um, <laughs> maybe that's a word for someone. Don't be a church hopper, hopper, ribbit, ribbit. <laughs> so, um, so I had a dream. I'm serious. Like, I have, I have this gift of prophetic humor. <laughs> So, so I had this dream, and um, all right, all right, behave people. This is a serious dream now. It's not funny. So I had this dream, and in the dream, I was preaching at a really big meeting, and I remember, and, and it went really well, and I, and I made people laugh, and people, I felt like people were really touching everything, and I came out the meeting, and then I went to the back of the hall and went through the back entrance and re-entered the meeting I'd just preached in and watched myself preach. Does that make sense? So the dream was happening again, but this time I was watching it happen. And what happened was I made a lot of people laugh, but said nothing. Nothing of substance. I woke up almost crying I probably was crying I woke up just mortified like God God please I don't want to be full of words with nothing to say God forbid I don't want to just be cool or liked or popular God I want to I want to touch lives with you I want to speak your words I don't just want to speak for the sake of speaking and, any, and anyway, I, as I was meditating on this dream, I don't know if it was yesterday or this morning, um, I, I was actually reminded of um, Whitney Houston's funeral. I only watched about two minutes of it. I, I just can't really watch much for very long. And I apologize if I am stepping on people's toes as I say this. Um, but um, I don't feel called to step on people's toes, but I do feel called to stomp on demons. So... So uh, I will go here. So Whitney Houston was loved. She, has a, she had a sound that was heard. And um, a great minister um, preached at her funeral and said she was the voice of a generation. And something didn't sit right with me. I was like, oh, God. God, what is this? I'm like, and, uh, and I was actually watching um, a video of C.C. Winans talking about um, a song that, that Whitney had asked her to sing on. And it was, I think it was I'm Every Woman. We all know the song, right? We've, we've probably sang the song. We've probably heard the song a million times. But I think, I think it starts with, I will cast a spell on you. Something like that. And it starts with that. And Cece Wannans was like, I won't try the accent. I'll slaughter it. But she was like, I can't sing that. I, she's like, I'm looking at the Bible and I'm looking at these lyrics and they don't align. I cannot sing that. I cannot, I cannot bring mixture to my voice. I cannot, she didn't say this, but this is me paraphrasing this. She could not contaminate her sound with the words of witchcraft in the world. And the thing about, the thing about Whitney, right? She never wrote a song. She lent her voice to the songs of the, of, well, really Satan. She, she lent her voice to the, to the God of self. You know, probably one of her most known songs, well, actually, most of the songs were either covers or written for her. But I, I was grieved at the fact that she was the voice of a generation. She had never written a song, which meant she was the voice of the generation and had nothing to say. And it reminded me of my dream. Lord, I don't want nothing to say. And it's not that I need to say something. I'm like, God, I want to give my voice to heaven. Amen. Like even, like even, I'm not saying she had to write songs, but she could have at least given her voice to God rather than anything that was popular. She had a voice that would have been heard either way, right? She had a tone that would have broken through either way. And you know, probably one of the most famous songs she she ever sang was the greatest love of all. And really, the voice of a generation had nothing to say and preached to the world, the greatest love is self-love. Self, 
love. And she said, it's easy to achieve. Of course it is itself. Which actually is in direct opposition to the greatest commandment. Her greatest love was in opposition to the greatest commandment, which is to love your God and love your neighbor as yourself. Because when you put God first, your neighbor and yourself come under that and the love is right and it's holy and it's in its place. It isn't like main character syndrome. It is Jesus is the main character. The thread is always Jesus. It's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God first of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? No, I was, um, I was in a conversation with... Um, I was in a conversation with someone. It was, actually, it was a room of uh, worship leaders and, um, and we, were, we, were doing some, we were doing some projects together and, uh, and uh, I noticed after a while, one of them started swearing and then once one of them started swearing, the other one started swearing and I was just like, as in, oh, sorry, America's cussing, right? You know what cussing is, right? Bad language, foul language. That's what... English people called swearing. <laughs> That's an interesting way to put it, isn't it? I question our wording sometimes. But, I mean, we invented the language, so hey. So, <laughs> so, so anyway, so anyway um, I was in this conversation, and I did not give in to it. I was like, no, I'm not going to give in to that. And they were just like, and it wasn't like, the f bomb <laughs> or anything, but it was it was swearing. It was still it was still bad language, and you would all consider it bad language. But and, and one of them turned to me and goes, and and she and I knew she respected me, and she respected my opinion, and she said, "Oh, uh, I'm swearing. Do you think that's okay?" I was like. And I wasn't like, oh, well, you know, if you feel like, uh, well, uh, you know, I, I was like, I was like, and, and I'm not, I'm quite a soft person if you, if you talk to me in person, but when it comes to, when it comes to God, I'm just like, God, God, I can't, I can't back down on this. I'm like, no, it's not okay for you. You are a worship leader. So you should know of all people that your mouth is your weapon. As the people of God, our mouth is our weapon. It even says in Proverbs, I think 18, 21, um, the, the power of life and death is in the tongue. And those who, those who value it will eat the fruits of it, whether good consequences or bad. And we will taste the consequences of it. We will taste the consequence of our words. And the fact is, if our words are mixed, maybe the consequences, actually, our prayers can be void because there is so much mixture in it. Is it like heaven is like, mm, that is a sound that doesn't touch the heavens. You know that scripture, if my people who are called by my name will, will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then, then I will hear from heaven. It comes with the repentance. Then I will hear heaven hearing. Is it important to you whether heaven hears it or not? Sort your mouth out. <laughs> I'm saying that to myself as well. Sort, sort my mouth out. You know, we all slip up, but just repent. And when I, say, when I say just repent, I'm not saying, I'll just say sorry and do it again. I'm saying just repent. Don't do it. Go sin no more, you know, like Jesus said. So if you are a worship leader, your mouth is your weapon. You know, you can find yourselves you can find yourself in groups of friends and often there's, there's one that's kind of, there's usually the Christian that's like cool and does it all and it's like, I'm all things to all men and I'm like, that's not what that scripture means. And then, there's, and then there's the one that is just like, well, I'm not judgmental, so I sin anyway. And then there's the one that's, then the, there's uh, the one that's like really judgy towards the, the people who are trying to stay consecrated. And then there's sometimes the person that's kind of, judging everyone because they're holier than thou, but that's quite unusual. And then there's the person that will live a life worthy of the calling, guarding their mouth because it is sacred, and they will sit there, and they might not even have to say anything, but their presence is a rebuke, and their, and their, control, their self-control is a rebuke to the lawlessness within others. 
And people, people have said to me, well, is it in the Bible? I'm like, yeah, yeah, let me look. It's in the Bible. It is. Is it? I think it's Ephesians, you know. I think it's Ephesians 4. Let me double check. I don't want to misguide anyone. So I think this is Ephesians 4, 29. Do, and this is the amplified version. Do not let unwholesome, foul, profane, worthless, vulgar words ever come out of your mouth, but only such speak as good as, good as is building, for building up others according to the need and the occasion so that it will be a blessing to others who hear you speak. So guys, if you were like, where's that in the Bible? There it is. You're welcome. But, <laughs> but you know, um, it's really interesting on, on this. Um, I don't know if James has told this story, but I would just like to say that this is kind of my story because he wasn't even there. So, so um, I was sat in the car one day and, um, and we just got home. And we, in fact, before that, I was at home one day and Justice was taking a shower and uh, this is my eldest, he's 10 years old and he came in from playing with his friends and um, one of his friends came to me and said, Justice was swearing, Justice was swearing and I said, no he wasn't. I was like, I don't think he's ever even heard swearing before, this is a few years ago. Uh, he wasn't 10 then, he was maybe seven, maybe seven or eight and and uh, he was like, yes he was, yes he was and I said to this kid and this kid isn't saved but I'm bold as lion. I'm like, if he swore at you, he heard it from you first. <laughs> and this child went red. And I was like, eh. <laughs> So anyway, I, I actually didn't believe him at first until um, my boy came to me and he's never, he doesn't even know what swearing is at the time. He does now and he knows he's not allowed. But he came, he came to me and he said, oh, this, this kid said, you mum are as dumb as a factory. <laughs> like, what does that even mean? And then, and then he said, and oh my gosh, it was just interesting how he pronounced this. I won't say the word, but he said, so I said he was an effing donkey. And I was like, Oh, he did swear. <laughs> and I was, and then I was just like, okay, justice, <laughs> justice, <laughs> sweetheart. We don't use words like that. That is not pleasing to Jesus. Something on those lines. And uh, anyway, we were talking, me and my husband, and and we were just like, justice. We just feel like when you go out to play with these kids, you are becoming like them. And they're supposed to be coming like you. So you're not mature enough to play with them yet. When you are mature enough to play with them is when you go out there and they are more affected by the light in you than you are the darkness in them. So anyway, so anyway, one day I was, sat in, I was sat in the car just getting my things together. We'd, I think we'd come back from a church service and we were getting in the house. James was getting the other kids in the house and I was getting the baby bag out and the kids saw Justice and, and, and the kids goes, Justice, are you playing out? And Justice goes, I'm not mature enough. And guys, you know, if you are going into these circumstances and you are getting more effective, you're not mature enough. <laughs> Stay home. You know what? I've had seasons where I've been friendless and I'm thankful for it. Yes, I'm in community with my own church, but there have been lonely times to live out this consecration and to live out actually, actually not even just sinning. Just living right for God and pleasing God. What, do you want to please people or do you want to please God? Do you want to be like me in that dream? I come out and I said, I just made people laugh. I said nothing of substance. I was grieved when I woke up. Imagine, imagine looking back on your life and being like, I was funny and popular. I had lots of friends, but I never changed anything. I never did anything. 
Are you, are you comfortable in those environments where people are blaspheming? Are you calling them out? Are you calling people to a higher standard? Because you know, many times, many times, and I was chatting with Matt about the whole swearing thing, and he said, he said, it's really interesting because even people who are unsaved will call you out as a Christian on swearing, say, aren't you not supposed to do that? <laughs> and, and then you're just like, no, no, I'm cool, so I can. <laughs> like, like, no, pull them up. Be the influence that they need. And I love, and I remember this, uh, this young girl that I was mentoring who came to me and she said, she said to me, Becky, you know, I feel like people dim themselves down when I'm around them. They just tell me, oh, you just seem so sweet and pure. I don't want to swear around you. don't want to do anything. I was like, praise God. <laughs> praise God. Be that influence. Be consecrated. Be holy. Be a rebuke to their lifestyle. Bring them up. Show them that there's a better way. Show them that there's a better life. This is, because this is so much better. You know, I, have you ever been in a circumstance, like I've been in seasons of my life when I was younger where I was living with sin. I was miserable. Both like, like secret sin, miserable. Isn't it like the best feeling when you have that freedom of that it's gone? It's gone, I don't have to live like this. Girl, Show them they don't have to live like that. And they will see the difference. And they will see the difference in you. Anyway. I lost my notes. That's back. Yeah. Some of you need some divine breakups. Some BFs, some BFFs. BF, I mean boyfriends. Some boyfriends, some BFFs. Social media, different things. Not everyone's called to social media. Honestly, honestly if, if I wasn't doing prayer storm... I'd probably, I'd, honestly, I'd love to throw my phone away if it didn't keep me organized. I think my husband, my husband's like, don't throw it away. You have a diary. <laughs> but honestly, it's, I, so some of you, some of you just shouldn't be on social media. Some, some of you shouldn't be, shouldn't be at some tables. And I, I actually, can you put that slide up, guys? If you can find it. I gave them a slide and it said, if I can find it myself, said, Father, Forgive me for the times I craved a place at a table you would have flipped. <laughs> I'm going to say it again. Father, Father, forgive me for the times I craved a place at a table you would have flipped. I want to be at the Lord's table, not the table of the enemy. Mm. And you know, even... Even going back into the music that you listen to, it's so important because I feel like God wants to uncontaminate some sound today. You know, when you, when you gossip, when you swear, when you, when you sing songs of the world, because actually secular music really is worship of self. If you look at, I remember I used to, when I was younger, I was obsessed with a lot of different I was addicted to music that's a different story but I was obsessed with Alicia Keys and when I actually looked closely at the lyrics which I thought were positive I was just like oh it's just love songs it was actually like idolizing self and idolizing romantic love and idolizing things above God and I was like I can't sing this what was it? Something like, no one, no one can get in the way of what I feel for you. I'm like, God can. <laughs> I'm like, God can. And there were so many lyrics that I was there singing, giving my voice to the enemy. And you know, and you know, if you think about it, if you look, if you look at secular music, you know, as artists, we write from the abundance of our heart. We write from our own, the own, our own idols, our own gods of our lives. I'm, I'm saying, me, just me and you, Lord, me and you, Lord. But I say, they write from the idols of their lives and they write according to them because they know no better. And, you know, if you think about it, priests of Satan are fruitful in the flesh. If you look at the lifestyles of the different, like, I, uh, I mean, I think Matt was bringing up Ariana Grande, Grande, Ariana Grande, and there's things online of her, and, and they're just terrible of, of the way she's living. And, and then all these different celebrities say terrible things about each other, and sometimes you don't even know what's true and all these different things, but, but are you sure 
about the source of where you are getting nourishment from. Because when we sing songs to you, we are preaching to you. And when you sing our songs, you are preaching our messages. Kind of like, kind of like Paul's letters, but in song form, right? Are you singing songs? Are you tolerating that sound around you? Are you contaminating your ears, like in your car, listening to music, listening to iTunes, anything, or even the radio? Like, man, I cannot listen to that thing. It just is like this sound that is just horrible. Like, if you, if you look at, you know, the lives of these artists, you see that they are fruitful. They are fruitful in the flesh, And if you look at the fruits of the flesh, it says, now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. So there's more. Things like these. There's so many fruits of the flesh. And you are happy with that source. I really feel like God wants to bring a cleansing and a consecration to your sound, to your ears, to your eyes. You have to be watchful. You have to be watchful for you, for your kids. It it baffles me why parents will, will be like, oh, I'll allow this with my kid because I would rather they do it in front of me than behind my back. So you're okay with them sinning in front of you as long as they don't sin behind your back. That's okay. You think the Lord's okay with that? Would the Lord as a father say that? Just sit in front of me, just not behind my back and tell me. And it's kind of like, well, he knows anyway, but that's not okay. That's not okay. And you have to, I mean, there are, there are different types of consecration and then there's blatant sin. Don't get me wrong. And you know, every, the, there are sins and weights of this world. Every sin is a weight, but not every weight is necessarily a sin. And you have to discern what is a weight in your life. Is this friendship a weight in your life? Are you carrying the weight of glory and being a weight to that person of substance? Or are they just being a weight for you, just pulling along and it's just this baggage that you're carrying? And it's really important that even, I I remember a time where I was in a meeting where we, we were releasing a shout and I remember as we released this shout, crying, crying out for revival, I was like, the sound, the sound was awful. It was like, mm. like, don't get me wrong. Like sometimes, sometimes things are too loud, but this wasn't a loudness issue. There was something in the sound. And I remember being like, there's unforgiveness in the sound of this room. And we need to go away. And it was like one of our Nazarite schools of prayer. And And I said, we need to pray about this, go away and ask the Lord, do I have bitterness in my heart? Because many times we have bitterness that hides behind, oh, I've forgiven them, everything's fine, but I don't like you very much. And some people are like, well, the Lord says I should love you, but I don't have to like you. I'm just like, what do you mean you don't have to like them? What, you you mean you can dislike? What? (laughs) Any, but, but anyway, there was such a sound and then, And then there was a lady who had this scream and then she came back the week after. Something was different about her and I said, and um, no, I didn't even say anything to her. She came herself and she said, she said, oh, I was crying out last week and I thought it was really powerful and I thought I was fine. And as I prayed, I really did listen to the Holy Spirit and he showed me I had bitterness against my husband. And as, and as she began to pray about it, God began to do great healing in her life and healing in his life. If we want to be voices, if we don't want to be just sound, we have to sort ourselves out and be like, and, and this is a really, really good prayer that I love to pray. Be like, God, what are blind spots in my life? Where am I deceived in my life? That is a really important one because we can be like, we can excuse ourselves from all sorts. Be like, I'm not called to that consecration. And honestly, when people are called to a consecration, often it's for a purpose. And if you are not faithful to the consecration the Lord has called you to, you will end up in a battle that you are not ready to fight. I think a great example of that is um, 
Actually, my son is called Uriah Samuel, which I said already. But, um, but in the story of Uriah and David, um, I, love, I love Uriah. His name means um, flame of Yahweh. And, um, and interestingly, he wasn't even Israelite. He was a Hittite fighting for Israel. He wasn't at rest. So, when, so the story went as David really should have been out there in the battles fields, in the tents with, the, with his soldiers. That's where kings belong during a time of battle. But what he was doing was he was, he was at his own palace feasting. And because he was called out of the consecration that is called for battle, because he came out of that, he faced a battle he wasn't equipped to fight, which was temptation of Bathsheba. And the thing is, when we come out of our consecration, it can cost. Do you actually know that there was a big cost to that? A baby died. Do you know, that's weighty. We just read it as, oh, a baby died. But a baby, you've seen babies, right? A baby died. That costed a life. And when we come out of our consecration and fall into sin, we can cost people their eternal life and their faith because they see you, they look up to you, and their faith can be rocked. And I do believe that's why teachers are really highly judged because of the, because of the responsibility put on them that actually when they do fall, people fall. And it's a sad reality. And I'm just like, God, God help me. Oh, God help us. God, I don't want to be responsible for the fall of your precious sons and daughters. I don't want to be responsible for that. Not because I'm soft towards them. I'm like, this is your child, God. This is your child that's precious to you. Of course you're going to come down hard because you love that person. You love that son. You love that daughter. And when we fall and when we don't take our consecration seriously, there are consequences. So... David, David didn't take it seriously. And Uriah was a rebuke to him, his life. He even, he came and, and he tried to, he wanted to get Uriah drunk and send him back to his wife. He was like, I can't drink, I can't even sleep. He, he slept outside uncomfortably. He was like, while wow, my brothers are out there fighting, I'm not at rest here outside of my consecration. Wow. You shouldn't feel at rest outside of your consecration. So I want to say, I love how Paul puts it. You know, there are so many different versions of the Bible and I look through all of them for my favorites. And it says, I beg you, I beseech you, live a life worthy of the calling. Is that Ephesians 4.1? Something like that. Ephesians 4.1. So I, a prisoner... For the Lord appeal to you, live a life worthy of the calling to you, but which you have been called. That is to live a life that exhibits godly character, moral courage, personal integrity, and a mature behavior. Mature. Are you mature enough? A life that expresses gratitude to God for your salvation. Not taking the Mickey out of, not taking that. You, you Americans understand that, right? Taking the mickey out of, out of the sacrifice that the Lord has made. Not trying to take advantage of it. Making a laughing stock of the sacrifice Jesus made by the life that you're living. I beseech you, I beg you, live a life worthy of the calling because the generation is depending on it. There are people who are depending on you, leading them. And their faith, many faith, much faith is fragile. Don't let your faith be fragile. Don't let your consecration life be fragile. Don't let your accountability be fragile. Don't let your commitment to the body of Christ be fragile. Don't let your commitment to your local church be fragile. Don't be fragile. Be mature. Walk away from places that you're not mature enough to handle. Be mature enough to say, I'm not mature enough. I th honestly, I thank God and, and, and pray, Lord, where I'm not mature enough, let, let that table reject me. 
because there were tables that I wanted to sit at that rejected me, that I didn't realize the consequences of sitting at that table. And I look back and I'm like, thank you, Lord, for saving, saving me from that table of compromise and immorality and gossip and backbiting and evil and immaturity and a lack of loving God first and then loving your neighbor. Oh, Lord, help us. Lord, help us. Consecrate us. <sighs> yeah, 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 Baba. Consecrate us, Lord. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lord, Lord, we need your words. We need your wisdom. Be mature to not be that Christian that when God says something, you're like, la, 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 la. No, that's my flesh calling me to fast. Your flesh is not gonna call you on a fast. <laughs> Your flesh is gonna be like, I think, I think I've got an egg salad in the fridge that's gonna go off tomorrow, so I better eat it. <laughs> be mature enough to, to, you know, resist the sin of the cream egg. But, <laughs> but guys, in all seriousness, be a generation who lives beyond yourself. Your consecration is important. And I know I've said it like a hundred times. I'll say it a hundred times more. Your consecration is important. Take lessons from David. You know, um, and repent. I love, um, even with your sound, there's this scripture. It's one of my life scriptures. I've got several. I think it's Jeremiah 15, 19. It says, therefore, thus says the Lord, if you return, repent, I will restore you and you shall stand before me. If you utter what is precious and not what is worthless, you shall be as my mouth. They shall turn to you but you shall not turn to them. I think that just sums everything up. I read that again. And Lloyd and Band, wherever you are. Therefore, thus says the Lord, if you return, I will restore you and you shall stand before me. If you utter what is precious and not what is worthless, you shall be as my mouth. They shall turn to you, but you shall not turn to them. Everyone on your feet, come on. We're going to repent because this isn't something that it's one or two in the room. It's all of us. And God wants to call some of you to new consecration, but some of you to deeper consecration. And some of you, there are things that the Lord has asked you to let go of that you've gone back to. And it might not necessarily be a sin. It might just be the fact that the Lord has said, lay this down and you haven't been faithful to it. I want to invite you back to it. Come back. Let's all pray in tongues. Lord, Lord, it's not popularity we're after. Shintara makia sintara na 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 yara ba 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 ba. Ha ba ra ba 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 ba. It's you we're after, Lord. Nira di di ana mara 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 ba 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 ba. Shintara na 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 yara mara ba 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 ba. God, we lift you higher in our hearts. Let your priorities and the priorities of heaven be our priorities. Cleanse my tongue, God. Cleanse my tongue. Forgive me for uttering what is worthless, for what holds no substance, where my words have been mixed, where my words have been contaminated by taking the sounds of this world, the songs of this world, the words of this world, the words, Lord, 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 where you've used, where the enemy has used us as his priests. Lord, we repent. We repent for coming under the teachings of the priests of Satan. Lord, reveal to us, reveal to us where we are in deception, where we do not see, open our eyes, where we are desensitized by our lifestyles, by the sound of this world that has influenced us so much, Lord. Uncover our eyes from deception 
Cleanse our sound, cleanse our hearts, cleanse our lives, our hands, Lord. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Those with pure hearts and clean hands. Lord, 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 bring a great cleansing. We want to ascend. We want to ascend. We want to go higher. We want to go deeper, Lord, but we can't be carrying these weights. The road is narrow and we want to fit down that road, Lord. We don't want to be carrying all our baggage and stuck. We don't want to be stuck walking the pathway that is wide. The pathway of destruction, Lord. The pathway of destruction, Lord. We reject it. Oh, Everyone repeats after me. Father, forgive me for giving my life, my ways, my tongue to be a mouthpiece of lukewarm words, of the enemy, of sin, of compromise, where I've led people in ways that are not yours. Forgive me, Lord. Cleanse my mouth. I give it to you and use it as a mouthpiece that will make Satan regret the day he ever tried to use my life and voice. Lord, would you entrust us with the deep truths of heaven to carry them on our mouth to carry them on our hearts and our lifestyles. Lord, would you use me and keep me and open my eyes to deception and soften my heart for abandonment, radical obedience, for only yes to everything you ask. I give my yes to you today like never before. I just want to encourage some people in the room. You might have felt offended during this message. I just want to say that's not you. That could be demons, that could be your flesh. For your flesh to be offended is a good thing. Embrace it. I often say to myself when I get offended, it's just a bit of flesh. It's good for me to get offended. Oh, you know, I feel like some of you need to pray louder in tongues. If you don't pray in tongues, just say, Jesus, Jesus, I feel like there is a cleansing happening to your tongue as you use it. Holy Spirit, we're sorry where we've grieved you. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us where we've grieved you, Holy Spirit, with how we live.
to pray this specific prayer because even towards the end of Rebecca speaking, I just started feeling that the Lord is wanting to call some of you in this room to unique consecrations. There's some of you that are called to business and because of that calling, there's a consecration attached to that calling. And you now need to begin to say, Lord, what is the consecration requirement for me to step into that more? Some of you are called to be in a certain sphere, in a secular environment, in the media space. You now say, Lord, I'm sensing you're calling me to that place. What is the consecration requirement for me to step into that space and not be discipled by that space? Some of you are called as preachers, as singers. You need to say, Lord, in fact, there are prophets in this room. You're called as a, as a prophetic voice. You need to be asking, Lord, what are the consecration requirements for me to step into the fullness? So that's what we're going to cry out to God for right now. Because it's unique in different circumstances. I see some people right now, it's like God has brought you here to reveal to you that you need to change your, your, your current friendship group. As you're in this environment, images are coming to your mind of people you've been relating with. And God is like, you need to, that, that whole group now needs to shift. And it's like, you're feeling this sense of, but Lord, I don't want to be on my own. I don't want to be lonely. There will be sacrifice attached to your obedience. And that's part of your consecration. Even if in seasons, it may seem like you're alone, God will not leave you alone. There might be times where you may feel like you don't have that friend but sometimes he needs to detox you from where you've been to prepare you for those destiny friendships. He's wanting to shift, there's someone in here, he's wanting to shift your, your friendship group right now. But Lord, they're Christian. No, but they're not destiny friends. And their lifestyle is causing your consecration to be lower. And the Lord has some other friends for you. So He wants to disconnect you so that He can reconnect you. So there might be initial pain, but it's a good pain because He's wanting to recalibrate you. So He's calling you to turn your heart to Him, saying, Lord, what are the consecration requirements for me? And that's all we're going to pray right now. So let's take a few moments, just begin to pray in the Spirit. And begin to lift your heart up. Ask Him, Lord, I know you're calling me. I know you're drawing me to be a preacher, to be a, an intercessor, to, to, to be a businessman, to be a, a voice for you in the business place. I know you're calling me to be a prophetic voice. I know I've seen it in the dreams. I know you're calling me to be an evangelist. I know you're calling me to significant platforms. Lord, show me what are the consecration requirements in my lifestyle, in my voice, in the way I use my time and money, in the people I draw close to. Oh Lord, I submit my mind to you right now. Begin to fill my mind with your ideas of how I'm meant to live consecrated. Lord, I put all my cards on the table. Would you come and rearrange and shift what you need to shift? And if you need to flip the table, feel free to flip the table, Lord. I want to walk in that consecration that causes my voice and the works of my hand to carry a unique mark of heaven that dismantles the works of darkness everywhere I go. Show me, Lord. I call on you. Show me, Lord. I want to walk as you want me to walk. Oh, yeah, nah, yeah. Deep consecration. Deep consecration. 
speaking of Samson's mother, there's some women in this room, you may be like, but Lord, I don't really feel like that's anything connected to me. And I feel like you're calling me to be a full-time mom. Can I say to you, there's also a consecration requirement on you. Samson's mother had to live in a certain way because of the seed that she was carrying. There was a way she had to eat. She couldn't eat certain things because of what she was carrying. When you realize God has called you in a certain area, even as a full-time mom, you're going to raise up Nazarite children. You're going to raise up an army. And so as the mother who's going to carry them, your consecration is important. It's not invalid because you're not in the marketplace making money. No, you are a powerful woman of God right there in your home. Don't you count yourself out. I know your husband is busy. He's out making money and doing all these things. And you feel like you're, you're not significant. No, no, no. You are more significant than you realize. There's also consecration requirements on your life. And so Father, we say yes to your calling and consecration. Whatever it looks like, we say yes to it. Move in this place. Move in this heart. I feel like there are people in here that um, there might even be one of you that it's almost like you feel like you've wasted years because you neglected the consecration and it was and it's like you it's like you're a Samson you've broken your consecration and there have been years wasted but I feel like that you know in the last hours of Samson's life he destroyed what he was called to destroy and I feel like God is wanting to restore years back to your life and make the devil ever sorry he ever went after your consecration as you remake these vows and consecrations with the Lord I believe he is going to cause a significant shift in your life and it's going to be costly to you but it's going to feel like it's going to be feel like nothing when you walk in what he's called you to walk in the lives that you're called to impact and the things that you are supposed to dethrone and destroy. So Lord, I just pray for these individuals, God. Bring back the years that the locusts have eaten, where the enemy has taken up so much. Lord, bring a restoration and a reparation. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Bring clear instructions where, where you've been blinded by the enemy. I speak over you, sight restored, sensitivity in the spirit and the prophetic restored. In the name of Jesus, gifts that you were called to walk in, restored and cleansed in the name of Jesus. You know, sometimes when you bring something, you feel the fire of God on it before you've even released it. I feel the fire of God right now on something. Listen, I felt the Lord was like starting to move on me and I was like, Lord, what do you want us to pray? What do you want us to pray? And the Lord directed me to Becky's dress of all those sunflowers. Can you see that? Now, the Lord, uh, about three, sorry, about four years ago, sorry, five years ago, out of the blue said to me and my wife, I want you to start homeschooling your kids. Now, I didn't know anything about homeschooling. She didn't know anything about homeschooling, but we listened to her. We listened to him. And the picture that the Lord gave us and impregnated us with was the picture of the sunflower. Now listen, the, in the seed, there is the sunflower. It looks like every other seed, but God has encoded the DNA of a sunflower so once you put that seed in the right conditions, what is in it grows up. The DNA is already in the seed. You don't have to program the seed. The seed already carries the DNA. But you have to put the child in the right environment to grow. I feel such a fire on my heart right now towards the fathers in this room. Not just in this room, but the fathers who are not in this room, that their wives are here. 
but they're not here. And they're not leading the family. They're not producing an environment where the family can grow. Now, I don't know about you, but I want us to pray for the fathers right now. Really pray for the fathers right now. Maybe you have a husband and he's lukewarm and he's letting every other type of junk into the house. And he's saying he's a Christian, but he's so lukewarm and you are tired and fed up. I feel like God is saying he's got a fresh fire for you to pray for your husband right now. I feel right now, let's go into a time of intercession that the house would become a temple again and that the fathers would wake up to the environment that they are creating. Pray right now for the fathers right now to arise in the Spirit and to take hold of this Word. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus, Lord. We lift up every husband. We lift up every father, Lord. We lift up every husband and father, Lord, that loves sports more than they love you, Lord. Father, we break off the addiction to sports in their lives. We break off the distractions to the things of the world. And we say, lift up your voice. Lift up your voice and be a sound in your house. Be, be lifted up and lift up the sound of praise. Of the fathers and the husbands in the 
to this word. There, 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 there's like a different facets to this. There are some sins whose hair need to grow back. Their consecration needs to come back. And even through this session from Rebecca, you've been feeling, okay, Lord, as you're speaking to me about consecration, I want to say yes to that. Living this conference, I am adopting a way of living that's not going to be the norm. It's going to be according to your word to me. And then there are people here, you're here, your husband isn't here, and you're the woman, like more the spiritual leader, and you believe your husband needs to have an encounter with the Lord, just like Matt was saying about them waking up. And then there are other, there are other people here as well, as you're hearing these words, you're feeling stirred because you know that you're called to raise up a consecrated uh, 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 family. It's like, you know, I can't remember who said, as for me and my house, I don't know if it was Samuel, as for me and my house. <laughs> and, and so you're, you're thinking, Lord, I want my house to be a consecrated house such that my children are brought up in a certain ideology. In a certain way of thinking, they think in the way of, you know the question I normally ask myself, who discipled Daniel? Who discipled Daniel such that as a young man he was taken away into captivity and all those years away from his family and when the temptation came and his life depended on it, he still refused to bow. Who discipled that young man? And we need to say, Lord, we want to raise up our family to be a consecrated house. Our children set apart to you. So there's different layers to this response. And we're going to invite you and we're just going to pray and cry out to God. The return of personal consecration. The raising up of godly on fire for God men who take their position in the household. And the restoration of consecrated families. So I want to invite you to join us at this altar for the next few moments to cry out to the Lord for the move of His Spirit in these areas. The growing back of lost consecration. The revival of men that are asleep and not occupying their positions. And the restoration of consecrated families. Where the husband and the wife and the children all together adopt a lifestyle in God. Lord, you said of Abraham that you knew that he would instruct his house in the way of the Lord. Right here, Lord, we want to instruct our house in the way of the Lord. Raise up families, households that will not conform to the systems of this world. Raise up families and men and women and children that together there will be a countercultural resistance to the moral decline of this age. Raise up a whole new breed of consecrated ones, Lord. Where a generation is drunk on entertainment. Raise up a breed of consecrated Nazarite voices that will know when to turn the TV off. That will know when to shut down the music. That will know when to turn the movies off. That will know when to gather around communion, the table of the Lord as a family, and seek the Lord together. Raise up a breed of Nazareth consecrated voices. The nations need it, Lord. Raise up a breed that will not come under the spirit of the age. They will not be infected and affected by the God of this age. Make us those voices 
Make our spouses those voices. Make our children those voices. Make our family those voices. Household consecrations. Woman, don't think, don't think your prayer is ineffective. There is a heavenly microphone to your mouth right now. Woman, pray for your husband. Don't be discouraged by the years you've prayed and not seen what you believe for. Right now, put your soul in this moment and lift up that man before the Lord. If you're single and you're not married, pray for your future family. Pray for your future spouse. Lord, we will be consecrated to you. If you need to make a vow like, like Hannah, some of you may need to make a vow to the Lord. Lord, if you give me a husband, we will be holy, consecrated to you. I am here in my atunefes, a tiny name kayo no mas, atulai ayana yo ases, abayo ne me kayas.
single and I remember there were lots of male ministers around, I remember being really disappointed in the standard and even the male ministers around me when I was single. And I remember saying to myself, God, I don't want to be the strong woman in a relationship, saying no to these men and being like, and being like, what, 19, 20, 21, whatever. I was like, I don't want to be the strong woman in a relationship. I want to be the strong couple. And I feel like, I feel like that there are some people here that you need to make your mind up that you are going to marry and be the strong couple. And for some of you, it's a declaration of, I'm believe, I don't want to be the strong man in my relationship. I don't want to be the strong woman in the relationship. I want to be the strong couple. Some of you are already in that marriage and you are making declaration of, this is it. And then some of you are like, I am not going, we are not going to be the strong couple. We are going to be the strong family. My sons and daughters are not going to be prodigals anymore. Or my sons and daughters are not going to grow up and rebel or the children that come for me are never going to rebel. And I feel like some of you need to make your mind up in prayer and stay on that. So Lord, we just declare we will not, we will not settle for anything less than the strength of the Spirit within our family. Right now, Lord, 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 I pray that you give me discernment in who I choose I pray that you give me wisdom in becoming that strong couple, that strong family. Lord, let me not settle for my kids backsliding. Let me not settle for sin in my kids' life. Don't let me settle for my kids having boyfriends and girlfriends that are not their husbands, Lord. Don't let me settle for a culture that is less than fire in my household. In the name of Jesus, do not let me settle, God. I refuse not to settle. We will not settle. In Jesus' name, we will not settle. You know, the Bible says, the Bible says to make the good warfare. I just felt in my heart the Lord saying, just bring a tiny one minute teaching. Listen, you never want to sound like the devil when you're praying. I'm going to say that again. You never want to sound like the devil when you're praying. The devil accuses you before God. When you're praying for your husband or your wife, you're not called to accuse them before God. You're not called to sound like the devil before God. You're called to lift them up. You're called to listen to God and say, what is the prophetic word over that person? And then you're to lift it up to God. You're not ever called to lift up accusation to God. That is the devil. So I want you, when you pray for them, don't think like, just thinking about all their shortcomings. Think about the Word of God over their life. And let that take over your prayer time. I just wanted to add that one point. You know, when we're thinking about families, I just feel such a grace and anointing right now to just lift up a prayer for people that are believing for family members to come to the faith. And I want to pray for people in ministry also whose sons and daughters are not walking with the Lord right now. And I also want to pray for people who are in ministry where you've seen the love of the Father grow cold in your spouse. And you're asking that, Lord, when we started off in ministry, He wasn't like this. Something has changed. Something has gone wrong. So like Matt said, we're not accusing now. But what we are doing is raising an altar in consecration and say, Lord, as we are rebuilding our altars and you are causing us to come up higher in consecration, we are believing for our sons, our daughters, our wives, our husbands, our aunties,
Jesus. Jesus. Cause the family unit to be restored. Let prodigals come back, Lord. Let husbands that haven't taken their position or have been deceived, Father, let your truth, your light break in and let your order be restored. children that have taken on rebellious spirit lord we pray even as parents begin to lift up their families right now that lord the spirit of rebellion and its influence will be destroyed over sons and daughters let the family unit be restored not just in relationship but in consecration to you Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. For some of you, I can just feel the pain. There's some women here, the pain. Like you've been cheated on, you've been left, you've been abandoned, and it's just multiple layers of negative things. And I think in one of the messages I preached here, I said, don't waste your pain. And let your, your pain produce a prayer. A prayer that, you know, what's it? was it Jabez that prayed? Was it Jabez? Yes, he prayed. He says, oh, that you would bless me. You see, that, that oh was loaded. Do you hear me? He was in so much pain. He was like, oh, are you with me? There's some times when you're going through so much. You've said every declaration you know to say. And sometimes you just need to lift your heart. You need to let that cry. You remember Hannah? You need to let that cry come out. Some of you women, it's like your husband, he abandoned you, left you for someone else. And you still believe God has spoken about that marriage. You still believe. And you keep having words about it, but none of those words seem to have manifested yet. I'm joining my faith with you right now and we're gonna cry out oh that you remember lord we're gonna cry out to the lord some of you the tears don't just let the tears be the pain but let let the tears be the fuel behind your um, your your intercession it's not just the words where you're how you're crying out, Lord, that they would be restored. You're not just crying because of the pain you've been through, but you're saying that this family would be everything you've called it to be. See, Hannah was feeling the pain of embarrassment, but then she shifted and she was like, oh, that Lord, you would have a consecrated son that is not mine. You see what I mean? She shifted from just God giving her a son for her own need to saying, Lord, I'm giving him to you. So she shifted to his agenda. And what I want us to do right now is cry out to God that, Lord, that this family, that you'd restore this, not just so that I feel good, but so that you're glorified and a family is raised that honors you. So just for the next few moments, we're going to cry. 
This word is so deep for many women in this room right now. Maybe not so, maybe not so many, a handful. It's like, it's, it's like this is where you are. We're going to cry with you right now. And release our cry that the Lord would restore the broken family. The broken altar of the family. He would restore that. Come on, let's do that right now together.
I see some of you women. The Lord is putting heavenly gasoline in your intercessory vehicle. Some of you came here, you'd run out of, of spirit energy and faith, hope deferred. Your heart had grown cold and sick and discouraged. But I see the Lord putting heavenly gasoline in your intercessory vehicle. And it's, it's, it's like the engines are firing up in you again. There's light at the end of the tunnel. You're beginning to see hope. Hope is, is, is stirring in you. That even now the Lord can break in. Even now when it seems so dead. Even now when it seems like this cannot turn around because it's been going on for so many years. Even now, even now, even now, the God who is the resurrection and the life is going to walk into that dead situation and he's going to look at it and he's saying, Lazarus, come forth. Even now, come forth. the Lord is doing right now just so much there's so much the Lord is doing right now and this is so holy to the Lord you know the scripture says he's close to the brokenhearted I just feel the broken hearts of many women that have just been contending and have got weary but the Lord is wanting you to be encouraged because He saw you. He knew you were going to be at this gathering. He has not forgotten all the prayers, all the fastings. He has not forgotten. I just feel the Lord and release me to share my testimony that my marriage is is the product of a restoration my husband was from a really traumatized background and never saw a healthy marriage by the second year of my marriage we had separated twice and moved home and I was like God I don't know this is not what I planned I don't know what to do. And God just told me, this is your ground, you stand. 
Doesn't matter whether you are on your knees or whether you are jumping or whether you're stood on your feet, you stay the course. You don't move, don't you dare move, sister. If you don't stand, no one else is gonna stand. He has given you that husband. He has given you that marriage. And when the enemy comes, it's because he sees a destiny on that marriage. He sees a destiny on that covenant relationship that can only be achieved by your covenant relationship. And sisters, I prayed and I cried and I wept and I had no words. But this is how I, this is why I know how to pray. This is why I can pray the way I can pray. Because I was forged in the fire. He is forging you in the fire, not just to stand for your marriage, but to stand for the generations to come. And that is what the Lord said to me. I said, God, this doesn't matter, what doesn't matter. I'm happy, I can live on my own. I planned, I planned a separate life. I was like, you know what? I could just get an apartment, get a cat. I'll be fine. I'll be a cat woman, it's fine. But you know what the Lord said? He said, no, this is worth it because it's for the generations to come. So you know what? We give over our request. It's not about me having a great marriage. No, no, no. It is about the generations to come. And you know what I'm going to tell you? This May, I celebrate my eighth anniversary. And we are more in love than we have ever been. And I'm telling you this because if he can do it for me, girl, he can do it for you. He is a faithful God and he is faithful to his covenant. So sister, just stand, plant your feet, plant your feet and say, this is my promised land. Anything else trespassing on this land is illegitimately on my ground. So get out. And there were days, you know what? There were days I couldn't pray. And this is the other thing. Don't do it on your own. It's hard, it's scary to say my marriage isn't working. It's really, really shameful. It's really embarrassing. But you know what, that's what the enemy does. He makes you really embarrassed and really shameful that you just don't tell anybody and it just crumbles in the background. Find the sisters who will stand in faith with you, not the ones who look in the spirit and your brothers as well. Not the ones who will look in the flesh and say, oh, he's not good, just find somebody else, da 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 da. No, 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 you need to find the ones who can see your husband, the way that God sees your husband, and who will come alongside you and pray with you. Who can pray with words when you don't have words. You will pray even when you can't pray. I had women who were like, God just put your husband on my mind and I've just been praying. And I'm like, thank you, because I haven't had any strength for like a whole year. But you know what? God is faithful. As long as you choose to stand and stay standing, <laughs> as long as you choose to stay on that ground, the enemy can't do anything about it.